still a few more seats at the front if you'd like to sit down. And there's seats over there at the side if you want to sit. You're welcome to stand as well. Welcome to Royal Vancouver Yacht Club. My name is Don Konitz. Gail had two daughters, Leslie and Aaron, and one son, me. I am the thorn between these two beautiful roses. Our family is not only from Winnipeg, we are of Winnipeg. And while it was 31 years ago that Gail and Gordy pulled up roots out of the prairie sod and moved west to join their adult children, we never take for granted the spectacular view behind me. The bar is open, so if you ever wanted to take a direct shot at Gordy's wallet, now is your moment. <laughs> One value that Gail drilled into her kids from early times was that you show up. 90% of life is showing up, she would say. So you showed up, and for that, thank you from all of us. We'll hear today reflections from several speakers. But before we do, I want each and every one of you to think of one word that would describe Gail. One word that personifies Gail and that really brings Gail to life in your mind and in your heart. Have you got your word? Okay. Now I want you to share that word so that everyone in the room can hear it. On the count of three, yell your word out so proudly that we lift the roof off this clubhouse. On three. One, two, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're gathered here today, united in our desire to pay our respects to our beloved Gail, to share in the grief of all our loss, and also to celebrate the remarkable life of Gail. Gail Conance, she had such a big place in so many hearts. And while we're all united, We've entered that door from all walks of life because that was Gail. She drew no distinctions, none, about where you came from. For Gail's currency was her curiosity and her magic was an unusual flexibility that enabled her to establish and nourish meaningful personal relationships that washed across the generations. I have two lights that I follow in my life. The first one is gratitude and the other is optimism. These are like lights on the front of my boat that have guided me through difficult times over the last seven years. Nothing diverts me from the path that is lit by those two lights. But these last two weeks, myself and our family have been unraveled by grief. Seeing all of you here today is just so wonderful and great support for us to help find our feet. Our family's been overwhelmed with cards and flowers, calls, notes, and visits on behalf of our family and all of us and all of those of us who love Gail. Thank you so much. Among the many qualities that are echoing around the room and in our hearts, Gail was the very essence of how to live a life of purpose and meaning. Gail grew up in a house with the sound of the clock ticking. By preschool, her brothers were gone, they'd moved out, and her father, Jeffrey, was overseas serving Canada in World War II. And Gail's loving mother, Kathleen, lived in a wheelchair after suffering an automobile accident when Gail was only six months old. 
At the age of six, Gail would be the only boarder at Balmoral Hall School in Winnipeg, being tucked in on weeknights in a dorm with seven empty beds, feeling lonely and lost. During the reflections you'll hear today, consider this context for understanding the origins of this remarkable woman. Gail was a cancer Jedi master. <laughs> at age 43, her life was threatened by a lethal breast cancer. There I was, a first year university student, sitting at the foot of her bed, or encouraging her not to look at the clouds, but the silver linings that made up the best part of the clouds. Gail saw off cancer a second time. Here, take my other breast, there's the door. <laughs> she became those silver linings in all aspects of her life, seeing not the struggle, but finding the joy in the present moment like nobody else I've ever met. Charlie Brown and Snoopy said it best. One day, we're all gonna die. To which Snoopy replied, yes, but every day until then, we're going to live. And that was Gail. What started as an innocent cough in January of this year was a lethal lung cancer that she learned about in February. But she did not tell us or let us in on how serious it was. After four years of work, Gail and Gordy had completed a book called Hasten Slowly, chronicling 30 years of adventure travel in Nepal with almost a thousand Everest trekking travelers, many of which are here today. The book was sold by donation, the proceeds of which would go directly to the Nepal School Fund for the development of a school for the blind in Kathmandu Valley and to help the disabled in remote parts of Nepal. Gail knew that if Gordy and Aaron found out about her situation, they would surely cancel their trip. So she bravely held it to herself and didn't, didn't say anything about her health challenge until they returned. And when we learned the true nature of the storm she was in, she was way ahead of us. She knew, she'd investigated it. By April, she had spent a harrowing and painful week at Vancouver General Hospital. She chose not to have chemo and radiation that could have extended her life by perhaps a few months. Not because she didn't know the treatments, but because she did. We knew time was short, and so we gathered at Gordy and Gail's home, moving in as we had lived together so many years before. We had many one-on-ones, and I sat with Gail in all her favorite places, and we exchanged our life experiences and encouragement. Ultimately, Gail chose her death in the same way she chose to live her life. She was and forever will be my Gail Force. To be raised by Gordy and Gail is to be raised by giants of their generation. If you want to stand on their shoulders, best not be afraid of heights. <laughs> I never saw Gail mad at me. Well, once. <laughs> My sister and Leslie were in the back of Mom's red Volvo as she, she pulled over and told me to get out of the car. <laughs> to this day, I think it had to have been Leslie's fault. <laughs> I was six years old and we were several miles from home. You're walking, she said. <laughs> Gail's driving was unique. <laughs> As a youngster, I thought everybody drove quickly. <laughs> I would marvel, and my friends would marvel, as our family car would get airborne going over the train tracks. And we loved hitting our heads on the roof of the car. <laughs> When I got my own driver's license and I found myself explaining to police why I drove so quickly, it just seemed I was required by law to drive a lot slower than Gail. When I confronted her about it, she told me that it was because Canada had recently switched from the imperial system to the metric system and I had to obey signs in metric. 
On a family car trip to Europe, it was late in the day, Gordy was driving and Gail was navigating to our hotel. This was a simpler time before modern conveniences like stopping to let us go to the washroom <laughs> and online navigation. In a moment of total exasperation at a multi-lane roundabout in Italy, Gordy demanded that Gail tell him which road to go down. Flustered, she noticed a sign, Senzo Unico, and she told Gordy, follow that sign. <laughs> After two turns following Senzo Unico, lo and behold, there was our hotel. We laughed at Gail for a lifetime when we learned from the hotel clerk that Senzo Unico was Italian for one-way street. <laughs> so if you're ever lost, think of Gail and just follow the one-way streets. Gail had two speeds, full and off. We've all heard the refrain, everything in moderation. Gail's was everything in moderation, including moderation. You've got to seize the day, she would say. Remember all those women on the Titanic that waved off the dessert cart. Her mantra for which she is best known, both in word and in deed, is carpe diem. Life and the events in it are like a parade, Gail would say. 1% are in the parade, 2% are watching it, and 97% of the people don't even know there's a parade in town. <laughs> that was Gail's ethos, to be in the parade and that she was usually at the front of a parade of her own making. I would marvel at Gail's cooking. Stove burners had two positions on the dial for Gail, max and off. One day at the lake, I popped over to see her and I walked into the kitchen. All four burners blazing red hot. Oh. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. At the back? Yeah. Okay. I would marvel at Gail's cooking. You got that part? Okay. So all four burners are blazing red hot. No pots on the stove. And Gail, well, she's laughing and carrying on impromptu with guests reminiscing enthusiastically in the other room. Gail was determined. One summer at Lake of the Woods, Gail was visiting her cousin, Jimmy Conacher, and she commented on the cleverly designed folding chair of his in which she was sitting. Wow, she said, what an incredible chair. Well, Jimmy made some comment chiding her that she could never build something like that. Well, she went home and built an exact replica of that chair and painted on the back of it a woman sitting on a dragon with wings saying, never underestimate determination. <laughs> Gail didn't hang about Winnipeg. While my father preferred trips to the west, to the mountains and the snow, she was more of an eastbound traveler. The more art galleries, the better. On landing at LaGuardia, she would describe her shoes as rubber gondolas. If I accompanied her, I would try to keep up. One step walking, two steps running. Just to keep pace. My favorite art galleries were the ones that had the bench in the middle. I would lie down exhausted while she would go and circle the room, imprinting every one of the paintings and works of art and critically telling me at dinner what they were all about. But I look back now and I realize, for all of us, what an incredible privilege it was to see the world through her eyes. Gail's travel became considerably more adventurous after her and Gordy's founding of Everest Trek in Canada. And they both found expression for their beliefs in Buddhism, inspired by the Sherpa people of Nepal, with whom they partnered and fell in love. Their home and cottage adorned prayer flags, 
artifacts, Buddhas large and small. One of the paths on our island of the lake is known as the Middle Way. A couple of years ago, Gail was frustrated about a certain deer that was coming around eating her flowers. Banging pots and pans of the deer just wasn't cutting it. And so she went to Canadian Tire and bought a high output paintball gun. <laughs> I laughed at her and I remarked that I didn't think it was very Buddhist for an 80 year old woman to be buying a firearm at Canadian Tire for use on Spirit Island. <laughs> well, she said, there are occasions when standards need to be relaxed. <laughs> the deer would continue to frustrate her despite blotches of paint on their hinds. And those of us who tread the middle way amid the tranquility of the lazy bluebells and purple clover, were careful to watch for projectile ink bullets <laughs> on our way to visit Gailimam. To know Gail was to know uh, an insatiably curious person with relentless optimism. A few years ago, she couldn't get her head around people meeting online, forming long-term relationships, getting married. Okay, maybe Gordy wasn't exactly the boy next door, but Gail had an old-fashioned sense about her. So she decided to dig in a little bit on this online business. She had her own laptop, and that was her gateway to learn and explore. So she went on Match.com and opened an account. <laughs> True story. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Here was Gail in her 70s, deliriously happily married since 1959, registering on Match.com. <laughs> She took all the letters in her name, Gail Konance, and scrambled them to come up with a new name. True story. Her match name was Glanet Zotnak. <laughs> in the aftermath of this ridiculous experiment of hers, I was filling up with gas in a small Saskatchewan town, and as I walked into the diner, I yelled back to my car, Hey, Glenn, do you want a coffee? <laughs> Every white-haired gentleman in that Saskatchewan diner turned their head, looked outside, and said, By God, she's here. <laughs> Gail loved magic and enchanted fairy tales. At her cottage, we have a wishing chair. It's a rock chair that we would go sit on, close our eyes, make a wish. Well, Gail loved that chair, and she loved taking kids, even whole families, to the wishing chair to make a wish. She marveled at magic because it was available to all ages. For her 80th birthday, she told us she wanted two things, just two things a magic show, and a bicycle. I asked her, Mom, bicycle and a magic show? You know you're turning 80, not eight. <laughs> so when Gail was in her darkest moment at VGH, I wanted her to look forward to something, and I asked her if, she, if we could organize a magic show for her. She loved the idea. She disconnected from all the LED video screens at Vancouver General and came home. The magic show was held on May 12th, and in that moment, we were all enchanted. After the fun, as the grandchildren filed out, we knew. Gail was content. She was complete. She was self-actualized. She had nothing more that she wanted to do, and she was so happy. Two days later, she died. In the aftermath of her death, I sent the magician a picture of all of us together and a text letting him know that, that Gail had died. He was in total shock, as we all were, as you were. I did a card trick with her, he said. 
What are you talking about? Well, a week later, that magician phoned me. He was getting ready for a different magic show. And he phoned me and he said, you can't believe it. I just came across the card that has Gail's writing on it, the card trick that I did with her. It's the most amazing thing. It's almost like I made a mistake or something, like this card was in the deck. And Gail had written her name on the card during the trick. So I'd like to do one more magic trick for you. Her youngest granddaughter is Lily. Where's Lily? Come up here, Lily. Okay. So I have nothing in my hands. <laughs> I'm going to reach behind her ear. And look at that. Okay. Thank you, Lily. How fitting that Gail would pull the two of hearts out of the deck and write her name on it. Amazing. And so the genealogist of our family has become part of our genealogy. She's now a, a vital part of the rich tapestry on which we dance our lives. I'd like to end by giving thanks for the life of a woman I'm so proud to call my mother. The unique, remarkable, extraordinary, and irreplaceable Gail, whose boundless energy and love will never be extinguished from our hearts. All the people whose lives she touched are going to miss her very much. And so will I. Now we have a little thing for you. A little gift for you to take home. And uh, Gail's grandchildren are going to pass it out right now. If you never had the opportunity to purchase a piece of Gail's art, you have one now. This is one of her sacred birds with her wonderful saying on it. We're all wearing it on our left lapel. program will follow and speakers will come up unintroduced and introduce themselves. Our next speaker will be Miranda de Pensier. We'll just give a minute, Miranda, for the pins to be circulated. Does everyone have a pen? Hi. My name is Miranda, and I'm Gail Conance's goddaughter. I live in Toronto. I decided last week, a little late I know, 
to look up the definitions of godmother and goddaughter to see if Gail and I had fulfilled our duties to one another. So <clears throat> it turns out that the number one dictionary definition for godmother is a female godparent present at the christening of the child. She promises to take responsibility for their religious education. <laughs> and the godchild, I was supposed to study and learn that Christian religion. Whoops. Now, I want to be clear that I do not blame Gail for failing me in my formal religious education. I was never baptized. And uh, anyone who knows me knows that I wouldn't have been an easy convert anyway. I haven't exactly followed a traditional path, but Gail didn't either. So, in truth, Gail was the perfect fit for me. The number two dictionary definition for godmother, a woman who is influential and pioneering. Gail was an original. She built her life on her own terms as an athlete, an artist, voracious reader, writer, traveler, Buddhist, and trip leader. An incredible wife, mother, grandmother, and friend. But what made her most special, she was always there for others, enthusiastic, enthusiastically supporting and celebrating the people around her, and how lucky for us all that she did. Because Gail was the ultimate cheerleader. Whatever I was up to over the years, she would encourage it. Go for it! Yes, yes, and yes! The sky's not even the limit! And her hugs were big and they were bold. I actually had trouble breathing after she'd hug me. Her generosity even bigger. Ooh, Ranny, she'd call me. Come here, look at this. Isn't it great? Have you read this? Have you seen this? Oh, have you heard about this? Isn't it amazing? And you couldn't compliment anything in Gail's house because she was so bloody generous she'd give it to you. <laughs> Take this book, Ranny, you have to have it. Just pick one of my paintings, any one. Oh, Ranny, you have to take one, any one you want. Here, take the scarf off my back. I literally had to learn not to say and compliment anything. And despite all the challenges she faced in her life, Gail somehow managed to find the positive and she looked for the silver lining in absolutely everything. I remember one time when I was about 11 years old at the Conances cottage at Lake of the Woods and we were heading to some fancy cottage at another, a party at another cottage and Gail had spent hours baking this very elaborate vegetable pie, which was the main dish for the evening potluck. And somehow during the boat ride, I kind of forgot that Gail's pie was, the big deal pie was on the bottom of the boat for wind protection. So horrifyingly, I stepped right into the middle of the pie, squishing it with my bare foot. I'd ruined dinner, ruined Gail's beautiful afternoon work, but without even pausing, Gail immediately said, They'll never know, and no one here is going to tell them. We will spruce it back up in an artful design. And as she stepped off the boat into the party, she said, announcing, welcome to my new dish, pita alla rani foot. That was Gail. One fell swoop, and she made you feel better and made the problem fun. Gail had an adventurous spirit and she went after what she wanted. My mother, Honor, one of Gail's best friends since 1955, shared some of her insights. Sometime in the winter of 1956, Gail and my mother joined the Winnipeg Ski Club and became friends with one Gordy Konas. <laughs> Described by my mother as just the most handsome, lovable, athletic ski champion in the Winnipeg area, and slightly older, so maybe more interesting. <laughs> in the fall of 1957, Gail graduated from the University of Manitoba and was sent off to Montreal. But before she left, Gail turned to my mother and said, now keep an eye on Gordy and report anything of interest. <laughs> 
Good thing there was nothing to report. <laughs> After Gail and Gordy got married, Gail was pregnant in London. And one morning on the London tube, she announced loudly to Gordy, because of course Gail always spoke loudly, that she was going to be sick. And a very formal gentleman next to her silently opened his brawly, presented it to Gail just in time so she could barf into the umbrella. <laughs> and at the next stop, she watched the man salt her off and carefully plop the brawly into the trash can. Pure Gail, overcoming challenges and making friends everywhere. In truth, Gail knew that she wasn't ever really a godmother in the traditional sense, but she kept redefining herself over the years. She once signed a card to me, your ungodly mother. <laughs> and other times it would be Gailie mom. But my favorite signature came from her when I was about 13, and she signed one of her cards to me Love your fairy godmother, Gail. Last week I was thinking about Gail and all the ways that she inspired me and I went back to the dictionary again. <clears throat> a fairy godmother is a fairy with magical powers who acts as a mentor in the role that an actual godparent was expected to play in many societies. <laughs> Someone that reassures us that things are all right and more importantly, that we are all right. Someone who sprinkles fairy dust. It appears Gail knew exactly what her true role, true role was, not just for me, but I suspect for many of you in this room. Gail was warm, she was kind, she was fun, she was hilarious, she was beautiful, energetic, and brave, our champion of joy, our fearless leader, our carpe diem warrior. And she would want us to continue to celebrate what she embodied, that joy, fearlessness, and carpe diem. Our fairy godmother, Gail. Hello, I'm uh, Jim Dowler. I'm a family friend, uh, old time friends of uh, both Lord and Gail and all the family, and I'm very honored to be up here to say a few words about uh, Gail, uh, who we all dearly miss. My first memories of Gail actually go back many, many years ago. When I was 10 years old, Gail was about 25, uh, just married Gordy, and they had just had this uh, uh, son, Donnie. And uh, my parents purchased a cottage at Lake of the Woods. And um, it had a boathouse with a room in the boathouse. And being the only boy in the family, I was relegated to sleep in the boathouse. It was a, out, entered out onto a quiet bay. There were a couple of cottages. The Conances had this compound on the other side of the island, so I didn't see much of them. Uh, but they did have a back dock that faced my, uh, my room. The bay was quiet at night uh, until it was usually Saturday night about 10 o'clock and Gordon Gale in this little basket or bundle of joy would come down to the dock and it would be quiet until the boats would start arriving. And there would be Mike and D.A. Nesbitt and Tony Stevens, Tammy Armitage, uh, Nikki McGibbon, I don't know if they're here now, I'm sure they'll be at the uh, ceremony at uh, Lake of the Woods, they're lifelong friends, but at that time they would come over to party. And the noise would increase through the next couple of hours. The music would be cranked up. There would be the sound of <laughs> there would be the sound of beer bottles breaking against the rocks because in those days we weren't so eco friend eco friendly. And uh, uh, there would be people doing cannon balls off the uh, dock, some in bathing suits, some without. So that was my first introduction to. Uh, 
the uh, Conances, and uh, <laughs> I never did see much of Donnie, and I just assumed that he was in his basket and tucked in the bulrushes away from the authorities like the baby Moses. <laughs> the next morning, I would go up to our cottage, and uh, there would be a discussion around the breakfast table about the party at the uh, Conances. Uh, my grandmother, Dowler, uh, I remember her comments. It was my, though, that young Conan's couple uh, <laughs> certainly lead a bohemian lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly at that age, as I got to know Gordon Gale, and through the eyes of a 12-year-old looking towards his future, I was uh, particularly attracted to this path leading to a bohemian <laughs> lifestyle. <laughs> In November of 1986, Judy, my wife Judy and I both moved to Vancouver, and in November of 1986, we heard that uh, Gordon and Gail were moving out to the West Coast, and we were very excited about this. One, to renew our old friendship, and uh, secondly, I knew that they would uh, uh, love Vancouver, particularly Gail, because at that time, in 1980, it was chocker, full, chocker block full of people who, in my grandmother's description, uh, enjoyed a bohemian lifestyle, <laughs> but particularly in Kitsilano where they ended up. Now, they arrived in November, and that weekend that they arrived was the Kitsilano Road Race, which was, in those days, the premier road event for two reasons, uh, premier road race for two reasons. First of all, it was the toughest, by far the toughest. And then secondly, the uh, organizers uh, had uh, hired an artist to paint a West Coast painting, and that was stamped on the uh, T-shirts. And there were a limited number of T-shirts, and they were only handed out to the finishers of the race. And so uh, they arrived out on uh, a Tuesday. On Wednesday, I'm at their doorstep, and I said, I have the perfect welcome to Vancouver gift for you. It is an invitation for an application to uh, enter the Catsalana Road Race. Well, Gord came through with about eight or nine excuses why not to, but Gail was just <laughs> thrilled by this. This is a great <laughs> present. She signed her form. I think she signed Gordy's consent. <laughs> and they were entered into the Catsalano. We drove down there on a, uh, a typical November morning, cold and rainy. The race started at the uh, Horseshoe Bay, uh, Bay Ferry Terminal and you would run along Lower Marine Drive for about a kilometer, and then you'd turn left and you would run for about uh, three quarters of an hour straight uphill, and then you would run through Upper uh, West Vancouver and eventually end up uh, uh, at the Parkwell uh, Shopping Center where the finish line was. And when I arrived, it was just a sea of supporters and runners and, uh, and parents and kids, and I wandered around for about 15 minutes, and there was Gail. She had a smile from ear to ear. She had pulled her Catsalano t-shirt uh, over her running gear, and she said, Dowler, that's the best welcome to Vancouver. That was baptism by fire. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the uh, uh, as you know, one of her favorite maxims, particularly after she battled cancer in 1980, was this phrase, uh, carpe diem, which is uh, seize the day. I saw Gail about three weeks ago. Um, I had just come back from a, a, a little trip I'd been pushing off. I wanted to go on, and I finally did, and I said to her, I had you over my shoulder saying, carpe diem, you've got to do this. And, and I gave her a little present, which was a t-shirt with Carpe D on him. She laughed and she says, actually in the last uh, few years I've up upgraded that to uh, Carpa the heck out of this deal. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was uh, true, true Gail. You know, this is a sad day and, and uh, we'll all terribly miss uh, Gail. However, we have to recognize uh, how lucky we are and how lucky we've been uh, to have her come into our lives, whether we're grandchildren or children uh, or husband or, or just good friends. Uh, she's affected all of us with her positive forces. And as we go forth, uh, we should honor Gail and perhaps enrich our own lives by, uh, at the appropriate times, incorporating her mantra, carpa the heck out of the diem. <laughs>
Thank you. My name is Emily Conance, and I am Gail's granddaughter. Um, when I first sat down to write this speech about my beloved Gailie mom, I thought the words would flow easily because of the remarkable person that she truly was. But when I began writing, I realized how difficult it would be to do justice to the warm, kind, generous, adventurous, spunky, and real person my Gailie mom was. I thought hard about what memories I wanted to share because there are too many highlights to count. She was our family's trailblazer, our beacon, and my inspiration. One of my most cherished memories of Gilliam was my time spent alone with her and Papa at the lake before I went off to Camp Stevens. She taught me about painting in the gray home, what brushes to use, and how to mix the paints. We walked around the island finding unnamed trails and naming them based on their features, Poison Ivy Trail, Pinecone Way, Wildlife Trail, and many others. To me, so many memories of Gilliam lie in the paintings we did together and I get to be reminded of them every time I walk around Allen Island, or as she liked to refer to it, Spirit Island. That is exactly where she wants her spirit to be, whistling through the trees and living in the wind at our family's happy, happiest place. I once read that your grandparents are the ones who really teach you where you came from and who you are, and this could not be more true of Gailie Mum. She was passionate about finding out where her grandchildren came from and helping shape what we became. For years, Gilliam put together a book entitled Family Matters, dedicated to her grandchildren, all about our history and where we came from. The weekend before she died, I was reading through the book and discovered that it was Papa's grandmother's birthday. So I sent a text to her and Papa. Papa replied saying that she was the first white woman born in Minnesota. Pretty incredible. Gilliam replied with, actually it was Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone who knew Gailie Mum knew how much she loved a good magic trick, but those people also knew that she was the magic trick. Every room she walked into lit up. Every person she spoke to left feeling happier and more inspired. And she left every country she visited ready to share a whole new wealth of knowledge. Whether she was traveling to a new country or venturing into a new social media platform, Gailie Mum dove in head first and with a skip in her step. I will miss her popping up on my phone, replying to my Instagram, sending Charlie the Cat Facebook birthday wishes, <laughs> or sending me a text to make plans. The time and care she showed each of her grandchildren was inspiring, and I'm so lucky to have witnessed this care and to have been a recipient of so much love and time with her. Gailie Mom taught me to be adventurous. She taught me to be curious about the world. She taught me to be fiercely loyal to the ones I love, and she taught me that time well spent was more valuable than anything else. Finally, I need to thank her for the strength and realness during the toughest of times. She was the bravest woman I knew, and her strength in the face of adversity was so inspiring. This very strength and bravery is something that I see in my dad, and I can't thank her enough for that. I will look for her this summer and everyone after that at the lake. I will see her in the paintings that hang in our house, and I will see her in the books that she wrote. She will be around forever because of the legacy she built with her hands and her wits. I'm so lucky to be able to say that she was my Gailie mom, and I will miss her so much. Thank you. I know, this is, but this is a tough act to follow. <clears throat> You know, I speak a lot in public, and I normally don't even write any notes, but I'm telling you, after listening to some of those wonderful speeches, um, I did write some notes. Um, and, you know, some of the things I'm going to say, I think, are, are, are things that we've all sort of thought. So uh, let me just start with my notes. Um, I'm Rod Samft, and uh, I must confess, like, Everyone in this room, um, who, we all fell in love with Gail Conance. And in my case, uh, that was almost uh, 50 years ago. Quite remarkable. But was even what was even more remarkable to me was that 
my father-in-law, Derek Riley, and my mother-in-law had fallen in love with Gail Conan. And their whole generation did. And then so did Sandy Riley and his wife and our generation. And, uh, you know, and, and Jimmy Dowler, and I could go around the room from our generation. And then so did our children. And they all fell in love with, with Gail. And you too, Gordy. Um, <laughs> So, so, so really, when 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 Gord asked me to to speak, I really thought, you know, that I, I'm I'm really not <clears throat> speaking here uh, just for myself. I'm speaking for m myself and my family, and frankly, for a great large number of the uh, the Riley clan, because you know we've had that incredible intergenerational bond that I feel so fortunate. Uh, to have experienced because all of those generations and my kids are you know we're close to Gail and Gordy's kids our kids are close to you what Gail created the bond that Gail and Gordy created is really just really quite extraordinary between all of the generations that they would just you know transcend in fact, it was interesting to me, that's three generations. A couple of days before Gail passed, uh, our son Derek was over there with our granddaughter uh, trying to make sure that she had had a chance to uh, experience being with Gail and the Conan's family. That would be four generations. That's great. Now, you know, when we heard the news that uh, Gail was facing cancer with the third for the third time. Boy, I'll tell you, this this rippled through our lives, not like a tremor, but really like an earthquake. Um, you know, because we, we've been so close, um, all of our family members, that, you know, I think it might sound a little bit hokey, but I didn't know what to say to our family. And so, so what I wound up saying was, you know, um, just, you know, boy, somebody must have needed a sort of a really happy, mischievous angel <laughs> on extremely short notice who needed absolutely no training <laughs> and could step right into that role. You know? She's perfect. She's perfect for that role. And so this weekend when Jeannie and Debbie and Debbie Riley and my wife Jeannie and Debbie and Sandy Riley and I, we were sitting around their fireplace in Kenora on a really blustery, rainy, not a great day in Kenora, sharing so many precious memories of Gail and the Conan's clan and all of you. We were sharing some really precious memories and we would be thinking about, you know, Gail coming to, you know, our family picnic, bounding up the path, armed with this, these huge loaves of her special bread. And uh, this is lemonade in a, in a, a, a jar that, uh, you know, I asked, I said lemonade, but didn't taste like lemonade. <laughs> and I was asking my wife what she put in it, and it did have secret mystical ingredients in it, you know, because she was such a whimsical, art, uh, you know, artist, and even in the lemonade. But then, but then, but then we looked through that wonderful book uh, to see her art, you know, munching on petunias. And the art, the art was so fantastic. And, and, it, and it was so whimsical, and, you know, right above our heads in the fireplace was this picture Gail had done of, uh, I think about seven uh, pelicans. And they're all looking down quite quizzically at this poor fish <laughs> right in front of it. And uh, I couldn't figure out whether Gail was thinking she was the fish or the pelican, how it worked. but. <laughs> But it was wonderful, and we all have wonderful paintings of Gales in our home, and I hope you guys all get a chance, uh, you know, to see them because they inspired. Uh, I know that Gail inspired, uh, helped inspire, uh, you know, Debbie to paint, and now Jeannie's painting, and she's built a studio in our our cottage because of Gail. Frankly, everybody at the lake, I think, started to paint because of Gail. 
it's incredible. So how lucky are we um, to have had the Conances on the island next door and to listen to, you know, get, well, I, I didn't have the experience that Jimmy Dollar has. I think that was Donnie that was carrying on the tradition. <laughs> um, but, you know, we'd always hear the laughter floating across the way, although one morning uh, my wife was telling me how she'd given Gail uh, a loon call. And as, as we woke this one morning, there was this strange sound. It sort of sounded like a loon. And it kept, it just kept going. And then, but it, but it didn't sound quite right. And then as we listened to it more carefully, it was the loon call combined with someone saying, come and play, come and play. And of course, who was outside of our bedroom window but Gail in her kayak. <laughs> so Gail was so fun, as we all know, and she was, she was magical, and she was so whimsical. And as others have said, she did sprinkle a fairy dust. And for 10 years, we rented uh, the Roger Murray's camp, and we did go to the wishing chair with our kids, and we wished for many things. Jeannie wished for a cottage. Um, you know, at Lake of the Woods, and which wound up next to the Conan's. Is how good is that? And our daughter wished to be, uh, you know, wished to be on the national skating uh, team, and that came through. So we think the wishing chair works. And uh, our family also. You, you mentioned that she was called Gail Force, and she was a force. You know, like. I remember I was in this uh, ski race when I was young and fit and terrific. I, w I was terrific cross-country skier, uh, except Gordy lapped me, uh, l lapped me. And uh, so I said to Gail afterwards, I said, well, you know, I don't know what it's like living with Gordy. He must be training all the time. Like, what does he eat? And she said, well, I don't know, but uh, I'll tell you, there's always three of us at dinner. There's me, there's Gordy, and there's Gordy's body. But, you know, she was such an athlete herself that that often gets lost, you know, gets kind of lost in the mix. Um, I know why she was called a gale force. I mean, you know, was she a breath of fresh air? I said, was she the, was she the laughter on our, on our lake coming across the wind? But really, she was a bit of a hurricane because she'd show up at our cottage, usually with her tribe, to demand that we play volleyball together. And she, of course, she'd bring, come armed with Catherine Conants as well, and, and the in-laws, who somehow not only adored her, but I think were every bit as competitive as she was. So yes, I've seen the book. She's written a couple of books. I've seen Munching on Petunias, and I've also seen Hasten Slowly. Now, I don't know. I have never seen uh, Gail, I've seen her hasten, but I've never seen her do it slowly. I have seen her headlong dash and her, her just grasp of life. And uh, is it, it carpe diem the heck out of, ben, out of the day or carpe the heck out of the diem? I've heard her express it a number of different ways. And she, did that in everything that she did. You know, she uh, biked at Lake of the Woods. And uh, my dear friend, Sandy Riley, is an Olympian. He's got legs the size of tree trunks. <laughs> if you try to beat him on a bike, it's tough. He's really strong. Um, he's quite amazing, actually. However, as he told me when he went biking with Gail and Gordy that, it was so much fun, and they started off, and they got all organized, and got all ready to go, and then they all took off. Now, Sandy prefers to ride with the leaders, but of course, he next saw Gail at coffee, you know, <laughs> when the ride was over. My, I didn't even, I don't think I even tried it. But I have to say, what a life well lived. I think 
you know, those twinkling eyes and that boundless energy, that attitude that, that gave, you know, you most commonly heard the expression when Gail left the room. Don't you just love that Gail Conant? And I did. And I do. So Jeannie and I and our family and our clan are so lucky because we've had 50 years of memories. If we could go back to that wishing chair, I think I know what I'd wish for. I'd wish for a little more. No, I, I, I think I'd wish for a lot more Gail Conants in our life. But sadly, as Gail so widely, wisely said, forever was never really an option. So, um, let it be said that our clan is so grateful to have had Gail, and we still have Gordy and the Conances in our lives. We'll cherish the memories that we made and the twinkle in her eyes. We'll cherish the sound of her laughter and the fun that we had. We'll really miss her. And uh, I don't know, if, you're, if you were measured, how would you measure your life? I would look around this room and say, maybe one of the best measurements of your life is how much do people really love you? And I would tell you, in Gail's case, it's a lot. Thank you. I'm Gail's grandson. Aaron and Sean are my parents. I'm here to say a few words about Gail. There are so many stories to tell about Gail. Here are three of mine. She always loved to play cards, and at the start of every game, she would say, Get out the tissues. <laughs> Which always made me laugh. I always loved to look at Gail's paintings. My favorite is called A Balanced Diet. It is funny because it's a stack of donuts and other sweets. It makes me think about the title and laugh. Gail was an amazing cook. She would have barely any food and she would cook an incredible meal. Gail always said a story must have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I hope you share your stories of Gail with us. Thank you. I'm Janie Adams, and I'm a pretty old friend, not quite 50 years, about 37. Nice to see you all, and I'm very honoured. Thank you. Well, Gaini Mum, she lit up my life for 37 years. She was my dear, dear friend, and she was also my very best texting buddy ever. <laughs> she was always there with an answer for me day and night on our silly silly devices. <coughs> Our last text was full of hearts and emoji bouquets. I'm having a great difficulty in that, not being able to see her with me in the future. Since moving to Kitsilano in 2015 and living just three blocks away has made for many spur-of-the-moment dinners. Gail and Gord walking down the hill to us for dinner in the rain soap with rain soap backpacks full of wine and Gaily's homemade cookies. <laughs> Together we had so many memorable experiences. The beginning for us took place in Winnipeg. Andreas and my first dinner at the house on Park Boulevard in 1981. Candles were lit and we sat in a very large dining room with a real Jules Elitsky painting hanging over us and I was so dazzled. Another watching Gailey jump into her beloved boat, fondly named 
hot flash <laughs> from four feet away. She jumped four feet away on the dock into the boat, always a perfect landing, while grabbing a, a rope midair <coughs> to, to send us on our way. The Norwegian flag was always present, flying high over Spirit Island, up for our stays. Gaily pounding her born-again bread in the kitchen with one eye on the Tour de France in the TV in the living room. We painted together hours on end, top floor in the gray house at the lake. Gail and Gore's joint arrival in Breskro in Norway, us yelling for you to see us in our tiny rowboat below the docking tourist boat. Once we were eight hours in a dugout canoe in the canals off Lake Tonlesap in Cambodia with no bathroom and snakehead fish for lunch. <laughs> Two years ago, I watched her cut down the entire bush on Spirit Island, extending from the cabin to the lake. And that took place in one afternoon. She dodged the poison ivy so we could have a better view of the lake. My last truly out of this world experience that Gaily Mum gave to several of us here today was a trip to India in 2006. It was an extraordinary visit to a large temple called Manaski in the city of Madurai. Our visit took place at midnight and we 11 anxious Canadian women following our leader Gail were guided through darkened hallways lit by blazing torches <coughs> to witness the bedchamber of the gods Ganesh and, Sh and Shiva. I'm not quite sure what was going on there. There was so much commotion. <laughs> but later we were told by Satish, Gail's trusted friend and guide, that this event had been going on every night and has been just so for the last 2,500 years. <coughs> Gaily Mum gave us so much of herself, I will miss her forever. Her very big, big heart finally came to rest. And love to all the Conant's family here. And everyone Gaily has ever come in contact with will love her forever. start, if you're seated, would you like to stand and stretch for a moment? <laughs> I'm a yoga teacher, so I think we should do it. Stand up and give a stretch. You can stick your arms in the air. Yeah. That feels good. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> I'm Erin uh, Conance Anderson Oberlander. And uh, for a brief moment, my husband, Sean, and I thought that we should combine our names and call ourselves the Conber Lansterson's. <laughs> but we thought that might be hard to spell. So you can call me Erin. Um, and I am the proud daughter of Gail and Gords. And um, I'm so happy to look out at this sea of faces um, and that to be here with you today. And thank you all for those of you who have spoken. I um, had this moment of sitting in my seat going, damn. They said the thing I'm going to say. <laughs> and uh, I thought for a, a moment I should probably s scratch it out. But then I felt really assured. So I just wanted to say all of the common themes that are coming up are making me really um, love my mom even more and to see that it wasn't just me that was impacted that way. I grew up in a big white house in Winnipeg. And my brother and sister were much older than me. They were seven and eight years older than me. And they just were always teenagers in my eyes. And by the time I, I was eight, they were off to university and to lead their big lives. So for the most part, I was on my own with my parents. My attention really turned to my mummy. She was my friend, my guide, my mentor, my teacher, my disciplinarian, my driver. She was all the things I would want a mummy to be. She was always, always there for me. Except one unusual day when I was 11. I found myself sitting in my Auntie Barb's kitchen it was a very memorable kitchen. It had yellow linoleum, little kitchen nook bench. And I sat there alone with my pigtails, looking at my Auntie Barb with her scotch glass, tink, tink, tink of her <laughs> in, and then the smokes 
you know, Sandy's here. So anyways, <laughs> I, I looked at her and wondered why was I here. I was very rarely with my Andy Barb, who was not the most maternal softy. <laughs> so I sat in that bench wondering what was happening. And the truth was that my mom was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer, and she was having surgery that day. My Andy Barb was, was given the task to babysit me. Not sure that was the greatest choice. <laughs> For two years after that, my mom was on a slow chemo protocol. She was battling cancer with a child at home. As a mom, I can't even imagine what that would have been like. I have a vivid memory of that time. I don't know who it was, but uh, my mom took me to an art friend's house to get something before we went grocery shopping. We went down into that artsy basement in Winnipeg and uh, she and her friend then smoked that something. <laughs> I remember thinking it smelled kind of good. <laughs> when we got to Safeway, I couldn't figure out why she stared at the zucchini for an embarrassing amount of time. <laughs> so I tugged on her skirt and off we went. She carried on, she always carried on, and I never ever heard her complain. And she kept on inspiring me. Now, <clears throat> Um, when I became a teenager, my mom would send me out the door every, every single time, not a fail of, of a day that she didn't say, now go out there and make a difference. <laughs> I would groan and roll my eyes in my teenage way, Aww. and then I would carry on, but I didn't really sink in until my 40s. What I did notice is that making a difference happens in a moment, sometimes when no one's looking. There were always fresh cut flowers on my bedside table when I came to stay. And she treated my kids with that same kind of whimsy and love too. She had these little elephant figurines on her windowsill and they open up. And every single time, my kids can attest, every single time there was a candy inside. <laughs> and they thought it was a fairy. My daughter's very mad at me right now because I just burst her bubble. <laughs> but what I loved about my mom was she never ever took the credit. And that was one of the things that made her extra special to me. My mom had a vision. She wanted her to see her kids happily married with fulfilling jobs and children of their own. That's what she lived for. Her vision didn't quite happen in her preferred timing though. And my mom was not known for her patience. While I dated a guy for six years, my mom was not shy in telling him that when she was 26, she had two kids and no parents. <laughs> it was very harumphy, and she might have been known to say, Christ died at 26. <laughs> What's the holdup? <laughs> the holdup was that he wasn't the right guy. <laughs> In my single days, if she knew I was dating someone, she would ask, can I get excited about this one? <laughs> one of my favorite moments was when I was able to say, you can get excited about this one, Mom, when I met Sean. With her own family growing and my mom's passion for genealogy, it, it took on a new, new steam. At my wedding, she printed a massive scroll, probably the length of this room, that had all of our entire family tree dating back to the 1700s. Just think about the hours of research involved. She loved to tell stories and was passionate about keeping our family roots deep. But her own upbringing being quite the opposite. As a child, she was often uprooted and moved around. When she was just a little baby, as my brother mentioned, her mom had lost the use of her legs. She grew up with a mom in a wheelchair who spent her days smoking cigarettes and looking out the window, talking on the phone. If any of you know Gail, that's not her jam. But with brothers much older than her, little Gail was sent to boarding school at the age of six. She told me she was the only child in the dorm room. Her mom never tucked her in. Her mom never read her a story. So how the heck did she become such a great mom? She never had an example. <clears throat> I would often wonder how she could be so positive, how she could emerge with no complaints. To me, that's the magic of Gail. Sometimes I wonder if she was actually made of magic, which seems to be such a common theme today. My childhood was filled with nursery rhymes and bedtime stories, the fairy house at the, at the lake, the Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, the whole nine yards, just total magic. 
Her big message to us has been to complete the bucket list. If you want to do something, do it. Have no regrets. And most of all, have big love. The love she has... Oh my God. Sorry. My brother and I get tiny voices when we start crying. It goes really high. <laughs> and it did descend into the diaphragm. <laughs> she, taught, she taught me to respect my husband, to love him and cherish him. She said, never, ever swear at your husband. <laughs> never, ever be rude. My mom was fiercely loyal and very kind to her, Gordy. Throughout the past 30 years of traveling to Nepal, my mom and dad took a deep interest in Buddhism. Her big quest was to let go. In her final days, she nailed it. She looked at us kids and would say, What's the problem? Why are you crying? I'm good with this. And she was. Gail was allergic to limitations and oblivious to her own capacity and power. While cycling in Kenora, as Rod mentioned, <laughs> Dave Rattray, a friend, said that a truck driver rolled his window down and said, Dude, that little old lady is beating you. <laughs> He didn't know whether to be proud or embarrassed. <laughs> because of my mom's childhood growing up in other people's homes and cottages, my theory is that she had to learn how to keep up, how to engage, and how to contribute fast. She never ever wanted to be a bother. She was never ever late, ever. In fact, when she traveled, my mom's bags were packed at the door the night before. But on her last flight, her last trip, my mom was calm. She was fully prepared and she was ready to go. She felt complete. My mom left me with three big lessons. <clears throat> One, get out there and make a difference. <laughs> right after her last moments, my mom was comforting everyone around her. Two, 90% of life is showing up. The rest is up to you. Life is a choice. Three, rise to the occasion. Always be a fountain, never be a drain. <laughs> My mom was a teacher and a connector. She could look at a room full of people, I can just see her in here right now, and be able to see matches of people who would elevate each other. You've got to meet David. He's an interior designer. Come and meet Susan, she's an author. Have you talked to Babs? She, she'll give you a master class in being a conversationalist. <laughs> She made everyone feel like they were the very best person in the room. Important, gifted, and seen. So who's going to make you feel so special now? Who's going to pay attention to all that you do? Who's going to recognize you the way she did? It's up to us now. I know that I've been taught and I've been, been inspired by my mom and that I carry on her legacy. Yet I don't take what I've learned for granted. It's a responsibility, but also, and more importantly, a choice. Her legacy doesn't just live on with me, it lives on in each of you. She gave you a gift. It's time for you to give it to someone else now. I can hear her now telling us all, you showed up, rise to the occasion. Get out there and make a difference. Thank you. Gordy, Leslie, Joni, 
and Yuri, and your beautiful family for allowing us this opportunity <laughs> to celebrate our Gail, Gailey Mum, Madam Gail. We are known as the Bridesmaids, a part of a gang of women who came together to form the first breast cancer dragon boat paddling team here in Vancouver in January of 1996, and a group of whom took on the furious celebrating <laughs> of any and every event we could envision. Gail was our spark, our merry prankster, our heart and soul. A Breast in a Boat was a six-month experiment devised by Dr. Don McKenzie at UBC Sports Medicine Center, assisted by Diana Jesperson and Sherry McGee. Is Diana here? Yeah. Oh. <coughs> Thank you. Part of breast cancer staging is removing lymph nodes from the armpit. There's a better word for that than armpit. Axilla. Isn't it? Axilla. I know. Axilla. <laughs> <laughs> thereby com comprising, compromising symphatic drainage and possibly lymphatic drainage and possibly causing permanent swelling of the arm and hand. Dr. McKenzie thought he could show that vigorous upper body exercise could help, not harm, the patient and asked for volunteers to begin an exercise program and learn to paddle a dragon boat to compete in an international regatta in June. 24 of us showed up and were willing to take the risk. No harm was done, and we emerged from the season healthier and happier than we'd ever been. We wanted the adventure to continue to give other women the same opportunity, and some of us are still paddling after 20 plus years. Gail was responsible for our logo. Her, this is it. Oh, you got it here. Well, I got to see the boat. A breast in the boat. <laughs> Duh. Um, <laughs> pretty simple. <laughs> Her keen artistic eye approving a quick sketch made by a visiting friend from Calgary. This logo has traveled the world as similar teams have formed in more than 23 countries and on six continents. New Zealand, Wendy Wellington, was our first big team trip in February 1998. Swamped by the huge waves in our first practice, we learned to stay upright and keep paddling. In a five-boat race against some burly men, two boats swamped, we did not. And Gail raced up to Don McKenzie after, grabbed his arm, and said, we came in third. <laughs> she did say it. She did. She said the whole thing. <laughs> it wasn't her husband, so it was OK. <laughs> the accompanying husbands in New Zealand were dubbed the spouse boys. It was the 90s, after all. Uh, and were even lured away from watching the, Nag the Nagano Olympics on TV because our racing in challenging conditions was so exciting. <laughs> Gail's next project, I can't hold on to this, <laughs> was the cookbook, The Way the Cookie Crumbles, a celebration <coughs> of our friendships, now a treasured collector's item. My favorite part is the donation page. It was, a, it was meant to be a fundraiser. Gail made this. I have a book and I want to help raise breast cancer awareness. <laughs> so that goes on the way these things do. A charitable number will you get. So check a box, $20, $50, $100, $10,000. <laughs> And other. <laughs> she knew how to do it. <laughs> then came Dr. Susan Harris's 50th birthday celebration. We thought we should surprise her with a performance. 
Susan had declared that she wanted to go all out on her birthday party at Cecil Green, so this would be the wedding she never had. Adorned in prom dresses, wigs, and vintage sunglasses, Gail and Angie and Sally produced words to the leader of the pack. You had to be there. <laughs> and we were launched. The bridesmaids. According to Sherry, our choreographer, we had 12 practices. Should be enough, you'd think. <laughs> our first step was to move to the right. <laughs> After revving the, hand, the hand, handlebars, you know, boom, boom. Gail loved that part. <laughs> but our Gail moved to the left. <laughs> we were off and running, completely out of sync, and laughing our heads off. <laughs> Christmas with the bridesmaids is a recurring tradition that just became more and more outrageous. Again, Gail and Sally many times rewrote the 12 days of Christmas that we performed at the dinner table, gradually adding costumes, and they became each year more elaborate. Prosecco wine and beer flowed, and the laughter could be heard for blocks. And laughing is the theme here, laughing a la gale, with vigor and without apology, is what we've done as long as we've known her. To let go, to change your mind, to sing with gusto, to hug hard, to practice joy and to love unconditionally is her legacy to us. And with gratitude, we promise never to let that, this legacy last, lapse. I think I can hear her now, chortling at these memories. Namaste. As many of you know, she really supported her grandchildren, whatever they were doing. And for me, when I was younger, I was reading all the time. And she also thought that kids these days don't recite poetry in school anymore. And she was shocked to hear that my teacher didn't make me stand up and recite Shakespeare every day in grade four. <laughs> so we came up with a deal. I would recite a poem to her, and she would help me buy a book on Amazon for my Kindle, because she was technologically savvy like that. So in honor of her, I'm going to recite one of her favorite poems. It kind of captures her spirit as well. The Swan by Mary Oliver. And did you two see it, drifting all night on the Black River? And did you see it in the morning, rising into the silvery air? An armful of blossoms a perfect commotion of silk and linen as it leaned into the bondage of its wings, its black beak biting the air. And did you hear it? Whistling and fluting? A shrill dark music like rain pelting the trees, like a waterfall knifing down the black ledges. And did you see it finally, just under the clouds, a white cross streaming across the sky, its feet like black leaves, its wings like the stretching light of the river. And did you feel it in your heart, how it pertained to everything? And have you too finally figured out what beauty is for? And have you changed your life? Thank you. I'm Jeff McDonald. I am the oldest son of Gail's older brother, oldest brother, Alan. Um, I just saw my cousin Michael, who's the oldest son of her other brother, John. So we're here to represent the McDonald part of the family. Um, my siblings wish they could be here, and I think my brother Andy will be in Kenora for that uh, memorial service. 
uh, I will offer a unique perspective in that uh, I knew Gail older, and she did something remarkable, which was to keep in touch and keep asking me to come up. And I, I didn't understand some concepts like family. I didn't. My father died when I was 14, and we sort of. My mother did a heroic job, but we just kept it together. And and uh, we were way down in South Florida, so we were about as far from Canada as you can get. And Gail kept reaching out and kept inviting me, and finally with my wife, with the conspiracy with my wife, they got me to come up to Kenora. And I can honestly say it was, it's been one of the most healing, wonderful, important parts of my life to reconnect with uh, the Conances and the McDonald's and, and Gail. And there was, we had so much in common. Um, it, was, it was interesting to see the genetics. I have a good friend who's a psychiatrist. Uh, I'm not his patient. <laughs> uh, we play tennis together on the tennis coach and he said are you ever in a bad mood and I said not really and he said does your energy ever wane and I said not really um, and Gail, Gail of course was so similar in that way we also loved literature and art and doing things and physical activity I felt kind of like a freak in my family because I was always doing things and when I met Gail and got to know her better as an adult I said aha that's where it comes from um, she, she was incredibly important to me. Um, there were so many gifts, so the theme of what I want to talk about are the gifts that Gail gave me. And one of them was um, getting to know her remarkable family and what an incredible achievement it is to as all of us have families. And, and many of them work really well, and some of it's luck, but hers, she was the matriarch of just an extraordinary clan. Um, I read a lot, as did Gail, we, we, sh we shared books all the time, and you're, whoever said you're, she gave me books, I would leave uh, a meeting with Gail with three or four books in my hand every time. But there's a, the opening of Anna Karenina by Tolstoy is this, all happy families are alike, each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And so getting to see the remarkable Conant's family uh, was, was a real gift for me. But also I was touched by how Gail wanted me involved a McDonald and how important it was for her to have a connection again with the McDonald's that that had been um, at least our part we were we were sort of the lost the lost part of the family and she she opened her arms up and brought us back in and it was a phenomenal gift um, so and that has improved me so as a, as a father as a husband just as a, as a person raising kill the children I have one grandchild just Gail had this way of making me want to do better um, she was a contradiction at times, and this one, this one stunned me. When I first was up at uh, Kenora, I think it was 2007, and I was about to have lunch after a, a, a vacation with the Conants is just sort of like doing an Iron Man. In the <laughs> uh, and uh, I was about to eat lunch, and I had my elbows on the table and a baseball cap on. And I did not know this about my beloved aunt, but the look she gave me was so withering that the elbow sort of flew back and the hat was off and I looked apologetically and, you know, 50 years old at the time and I felt utterly ashamed, chastened. The other one was that, uh, when I came up here um, in 2011 when Don was just finishing his uh, radiation, I came out in, I think it was December of 2011. and. Uh, was, was staying with Gail, and um, I pulled out a wallet that I had. I'm, like Gail, I'm very frugal, and my, I'm, I'm not often good at buying things for myself. I'll buy my kids things. Uh, I had a wallet that was made of Velcro and was of some awful color, and I thought, this is great. If I lose it, I'll see it in the woods. It made perfect sense to me. I put it out on the, on the table, and it, I could have had a soiled diaper. <laughs> but Gail's look was so appalled. I saw it. It was literally, she, like, and the look said it all, you're a grown man. You need a wallet. Act like a grown man. So it was this fascinating combination of loving, non-judgmental, but by God, get it together. And, and it, was a, it was a fascinating corrective. Um, I called them her admonishments. And uh, that was another gift. And because really, we need that in life. We need someone to have a standard for us or see that we could be better. So she bought me, uh, we went on a walk to, there's a market near here under a bridge. Um, and she bought me a beautiful 
leather wallet and gave it to me as a gift. But on one condition, get everything out of this other wallet into this one in about, you have two minutes. And then she promptly threw it away. And it was, it was, she, she was so satisfied throwing that ugly Velcro wallet away. But it was a gift, wasn't it? It was quite a gift. Um, much has been said of her, her energy. And she, when my mother died later in 2011, Gail was there a day later from Vancouver down to Naples, Florida. And it was fascinating to watch her go to all of Alan's grandchildren and connect and take pictures and literally bounce off of them. And, uh, and out of that, in this sad time, made this wonderful book of photographs of my mom and my dad and uh, the grandchildren and us. Uh, it was amazing. And it's something that I look at all the time, which gives me great solace when I miss my mom and, and want to be with her. And it's, a, it's just something Gail did. She thought of, how can I, how can I heal? It was just, just a remarkable gift. Um, so she taught us, she gave us the gift of a model of how to live. We've talked about that. Travel, art. She was the relative I bragged about. I've got these relatives in Vancouver, Gordon and Gail. They go to Nepal. I mean, they're not just, uh, you know, playing shuffleboard in retirement. They're in the, they're, they're riding bikes in Italy. They're doing all of these, these magical, uh, creative things. That was another gift, her creativity, her art. I've been pouring through her books. Um, uh, the photographs, we haven't talked about enough. They're remarkable. They're, the, they're, they're so unbelievably empathetic to, the, to who she, they're about a person and she looks at them and she portrays them with such dignity and not every photographer can do that. It's just again another amazing gift she had. Um, the final gift she gave me, and I think by extension uh, uh, many of you, was how to die. We're a, we're a culture that doesn't talk about dying. We're going to die and she showed us how. And that email she sent out, she used a fascinating word. Remember this phrase, I'm quite sanguine about it. Do you remember that word? And I thought, what a perfect word. And I kind of researched the etymology a little bit. Um, sanguine comes from blood, right? And it's one of the four humors in medieval medicine with, you know, choleric, melancholic, and phlegmatic. And it's the happiest, the optimistic one. And that certainly was Gail. So here's the one definition of sanguine. Optimistic or positive, especially in an apparently bad or difficult situation. Sanguine. Um, also with her, her love of family. Again, that was a gift she gave me. Um, blood, the, the meaning of blood, the connection, genetics, genealogy, and that she would use that word sanguine. Because when I read it, it literally leapt off the computer screen at me and, and I, I, there was something about the word sanguine. Um, it's also uh, it's characterized by abundance and active circulation of blood, warm and ardent. And I thought that's incredible she chose that word to describe the predicament she was in and, and then also to say this is how I'm going to act uh, here at the end. This is the end game I'm going to play. And uh, so honorable. There's one other uh, meaning of the word sanguine. It is a red chalk used in drawing. It resembled the color of dried blood. So again, with her artistic, creative side to, uh, uh, to have chosen that word. I am so honored to be here today and uh, to honor Gail and uh, I love her. And there's a poem that she and I discussed and it was um, W.H. Auden's poem on Yeats's death. And there's a great line in it. Uh, I'll steal Auden's line and use Gail's name instead of Yeats's name. Earth receive an honored guest. Gail Coyance is laid to rest. Thank you. Well, thank you for those incredible tributes and um, very nourishing words to our family and to everyone here. Just really wonderful. Um, you're invited to stay. We're going to gather just over here at the edge of the carpet. And um, the bar is open. There's lots of food. And uh, it's a beautiful day. Um, 
we got this club. So let's uh, <laughs> let's celebrate Gail and uh, enjoy it. There's a book at the uh, at the back of the um, room, just on your way out. Please make sure that you um, not only sign the book, but write the word down that you used when you yelled out that maybe we all couldn't decipher. Really important. And um, I know some of you have traveled a long way to be with us, and um, and we want to make sure that we have appropriate time with all of you. So. Um, just um, thank you so much for coming and for celebrating Gail and uh, this remarkable person. Thank you.